Forgot my coffee and water. Hold on. Okay, now that we're, now that I've put these precariously on the edge of a table, this is going to go good. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, the latency today seems longer than usual, and it drives me bonkers. Um, so I apologize for uh, basically getting really distracted by what happened 25, 30 seconds ago. Um, say hello in the chat. Um, we'll get started in, uh, another minute or two. We'll let as many folks, um, uh, let as many folks join uh, so that we don't miss the beginning stuff. Um, hello. I've got, uh, had, I struggled with, um, lighting today, uh, and sound. So this is, we're off to a good start. Um, so... Hopefully the uh, hopefully the the software behaves. Uh, hey hey Daniel Rob hello good morning. I've still got um, I am gonna knock that water off. I'm gonna put that back. Uh, I've got my coffee. Uh, we got a little home roasted espresso there. Um, ooh we got folks from the UK. I love I love hearing about countries that I would love to go visit and can't right now. Um, that makes me feel really good. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Rob, I will be drinking this coffee, uh, until about, uh, 11 or so, and then I'll have to shut it down and, and do some exercise. So I'm able to sleep tonight. Hello, Nicholas. Ossian. Wow. We've got, we've got a number of folks already joined already. Cool. All right. We'll give, give folks, it's only 10 one. We'll give folks, uh, um, another minute or two. I've got. Uh, cool stuff today. Um, speaker drivers. Uh, I've got I've got show and tell happening here off to the left. Uh, I'm on a concrete floor right now, so I'm a little afraid of dropping something. So hopefully we don't have a oopsie. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Lightweight. Yeah. Well. Um, then I'll start in with the whiskey at about four, so it'll be good. It'll be good. <laughs> California, ooh. Well, it's not so early. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, time zones being what they are. Uh, one of these days, I'm gonna have to do one of these things like late at night, so the folks in Australia, um, uh, and Asia can can join. Uh, I always feel bad for sort of excluding uh, them, time zone wise. So, all right. Well, it is well one more minute. Um, so, if at any point you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, start loading up the chat with with questions that you you uh, want me to try and get to. Um, I may not get to them all today. Um, hey, Ben. In Sweden, it's beer o'clock already. Last time I was Sweden, I was in Sweden. Uh, we flew out of Sweden, and it was seven o'clock in the morning. And there were folks having pastry and beer for breakfast. I'm not sure what time it isn't. Um, uh, uh, beer o'clock. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. Um, uh, I will also be honest in that I tried it, um, and it was better than uh, uh, I expected. Um, so I was like, well, when, when in Rome or in this case, Sweden. <laughs> oh, wow. Somebody, somebody from Australia. Wow. It's, isn't it like, you know, 4am in Australia right now? Um, um, Daniel, are you also having a beer? <laughs> Milan. Oh, I, I was in Milan in 2006. Uh, I, I, Beautiful city. Loved it. Uh, had a great time. Uh, I ate uh, way too much and I drank way too much. So I'm pretty sure I did a good job um, in Milan. Uh, I really, really like the uh, uh, three o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Woo. Sorry. <laughs> um, I really, really like the concept uh, in Italy that um, the shops that sell you espresso in the morning um, sell you ice cream in the middle of the day and little sandwiches. 
and then are also the wine bar at night. Um, that's an excellent mixture. You can just keep coming back. It's great. <laughs> coffee. Okay. <laughs> Daniel's drinking coffee. I'm, I'm not surprised. All right, we'll get started. Uh, so enough, enough wine and food talk. Now I'm just going to be hungry by the end of this thing. Um, all right. So, uh, today I'm talking about, uh, passive crossovers and, um, the, you know, this is sort of a, a, a fairly complex subject. Um, you know, when I, when I went to engineering school, uh, I didn't understand at the time when they were going through some of the, you know, J Omega, blah, blah, T, blah, all this uh, differential equations for some of these things, how this was eventually going to relate. It took me a while to, to get it. I'm going to try and teach this in a way where I minimize the math. Um, there are going to be some terms that I use uh, that are fairly technical. Uh, that's the the, the only way to do it is sort of describe this stuff um, uh, using those terms, okay? So the easiest way when you're, when you're doing a passive crossover, what you have to realize is that um, with, with very, that basically you, you only have the option of taking away signal, okay? Um, and so, and and that doesn't mean you're wasting power. This is a this is an error that a lot of people get um, wrong. This is something that a lot of people get wrong. They see a passive crossover in in front of a driver, and the driver may have had a rated sensitivity of 93, 94 decibels, uh, 2.83 volts, one meter. Um, and the completed speaker is sitting there at about 90 decibels, uh, 2.83 volts, one meter. And they think that you've thrown away half of your power. And there are ways to do this in a passive cro crossover where you're really not. You're, you're not throwing away power um, because in at least two of the three passive crossover elements, uh, power dissipation uh, is very, very small. Um, so... So conservation of energy, it, it's not thrown away. Um, uh, and, and so, um, so it, you only have the option to take away signal, really, okay? Um, some high Q filters might, might indicate otherwise, but, but in reality, you're taking, taking away signal. Um, and, and what you have to remember is that resistors take away that signal broadband okay capacitors and inductors do that differently and i'm gonna i'm actually gonna go about all the way back to capacitors and inductors so i've got some examples here right here's a uh, high quality uh, film cap here's a uh, bipolar electrolytic right uh, the easiest one to explain construction and sort of uh, theory of how the thing works is the old inductor, okay? And um, it's pretty obvious from just looking at it that this is a coil of wire, right? And based on the geometry and the number of turns and what the core material of this wire is, that will determine the total inductance that you have. So it's easy to remember what inductors do in a passive circuit by thinking of the construction. At DC, this is just a length of wire. So low frequencies pass right on through the inductor. And at high frequencies, the inductance um, of, of this device means that its impedance will go up. And so you'll start blocking high frequencies from getting to your driver, okay? A capacitor, and, and inductors come in many forms. Uh, this is an air core. This is a uh, high power laminate steel core. Um, I think this thing's rated for like 500 watts. Um, I pretty much use these exclusively. There is a third kind, um, and I have one as an example, but I don't like them. Um, these uh, potted ferrite cores, 
Um, there's a there's a high quality one made by my Jansen. Um, they make some good ones actually. Uh, but in general, I avoid these because at low frequencies, this core um, causes a fair amount of distortion. Um, it's easy to saturate if you're if you're looking for the 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 technical term, and it causes a fair amount of distortion. So I tend to avoid these, and and it, it's pretty it's pretty abrupt. It'll actually sound like hard clipping of an amplifier uh, if you do it badly enough. No, don't ask me how I know that. Um, so a capacitor is made the opposite of an inductor. Instead of a single wire that you coil up, there is uh, one conductor connected to one lead and another conductor connected to another lead. And they will actually take these and they will put materials through them, uh, between them, that insulate the two conductors from each other and prevent uh, prevent the thing from shorting out internally. Then they'll wind them up and or they'll fold them over each other. And um, they, if you think about it that way, those two conductors aren't connected, right? So how does how does a signal get through them at DC? It doesn't. So these block low frequencies, right? And let high frequencies through, okay? Um, I don't have a resistor. I forgot, I mean, I have... <laughs> I don't have a resistor on the desk. Um, I have hundreds of them over there. Um, and as I said, those sort of let the signal through um, and they try to evenly drop it all down. So this blocks low frequency, lets high frequency through. This blocks high frequency, lets low frequency through. And a resistor sort of moves everything down, okay? Resistors and capacitors for, for passive audio crossovers are amongst the most perfect components that we'll use, okay? There is a lot of hullabaloo around, um, that's my $10 word for the day, uh, there's a lot of hullabaloo around um, getting fancier and fancier ones of these, and I don't understand it. Um, the reason not to use these electrolytics um, is that over time they'll drift uh, in value, whereas these don't. But if you just put a signal through these, even at fairly high levels um, or low levels, uh, and you compare the amount of whatever non-ideal thing is happening to what the speaker driver is doing at those levels, the speaker driver itself is by far the more non-linear, non-perfect device, okay? Um, I would actually even argue that uh, depending if you're using these kinds and depending on the, the exact speaker driver, like these compression drivers, that air <laughs> has more of an impact. <laughs> uh, I can uh, One of these days I'll do a, a DIY RM paper on that. So, so I don't worry too, too much about... Um, uh, uh, I don't worry too, too much about spending a ton of money on these. I get sort of nice, you know, base level film caps. Um, I will spend good money on uh, a thick gauge um, uh, laminate core inductor to prevent that saturation problem and to keep the equivalent series resistance low. Okay, these are the, uh, of the three passive crossover devices, these are the least ideal, right? Uh, there's, there's, there's series resistance in this winding that will start to drop your signal level. And it does it, um, because the speaker impedance is moving up and down. It does it unevenly. Okay. And so you can minimize that by using sort of bigger, expensive ones than, uh, these. And, and I have some massive, I didn't bring one over here. I should have, should have shown it off. I have some from, from some hi-fi speakers that I used to, uh, professionally make and sell. I have some massive air core jobbies that, God, they were as expensive as the woofers. Uh, but it was partially marketing and partially performance. We, we wanted to make sure that there was no, uh, no degradation through the, the inductor that the woofer ended up being the limit, not the, not the inductor. Um, so I'm checking to make sure I've been talking a while. Okay. So we don't have questions yet. All right. So, so that sort of, um, covers the, the crossover parts. The next thing we need to talk about is something called a transfer function, okay? And the the thing that you have to remember with a transfer function 
Um, <laughs> Merry Christmas to everyone, belated, and Happy uh, New Year. Um, uh, I will, <laughs> I will still be in the house. <laughs> Yay! Um, so, uh, so a transfer function. Um, if you substitute the word frequency response or the phrase frequency response, that's a really good description of it. And and on the screen, you see a uh, transfer function, an example transfer function. This is a, uh, I think it is a uh, passive. It is a it is a uh, first order um, 6 dB roll off uh, at 1800 hertz. So uh, this is, uh, this curvature has a shape to it and a name. So one of the things that you see is speakers rated with a second order or fourth order linkwitz riley crossover or Bessel or Bullock or whatever, right? Um, a long time ago, I stopped worrying uh, about named crossover transfer functions um, in large part. Um, some of that is because historically, if you look back at it, the, they were named uh, by either the mathematician or they're named after the mathematician that developed the curve or described the math around it, or uh, the engineer that developed the particular filter for a particular purpose. And the vast majority of them uh, have been invented for general electronics filtering and, frankly, communication systems. Okay, um, uh, the notable exception is the is the Linkwitz Riley crossover. And what a lot of people get wrong with these is that they think if they apply a filter that is that transfer function that shape to a speaker driver, that they have that crossover. And they don't, okay? Because the speaker driver has its own transfer function. And if you apply a Linkwitz Riley or a Butterworth or um, uh, a Bessel or whatever shape to an existing speaker driver, you get the multiplication of the two. <laughs> you get the combination of the two. And you don't end up with the acoustical transfer function that that named transfer function is. You don't end up with that thing. You end up with this combination of the two. Um, so that's why I, I frankly stopped, uh, especially for like uh, PA speakers and things like that, because um, very often the named functions don't blend the drivers the way I want them to at the crossover and give me the coverage area. Uh, Charlie Hughes at Excelsior Audio has some some great stuff around using all pass filters to sort of uh, manipulate uh, beam width and things like that. And it's fantastic stuff. Uh, but it just goes to show that if I applied, if I just blindly applied a Linkwitz Riley crossover to this uh, 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 PA speaker with a 12 inch woofer and a horn tweeter, um, that I wouldn't get what I wanted. Um, I wouldn't necessarily get the benefits of the Linkwitz Riley crossover because the Linkwitz Riley crossover depends on both drivers having a very wide uh, dispersion pattern, and I've taken that away because I put a horn on the tweeter. Um, so yeah, so th so so that's a long-winded way of saying um, I will use them, but I'm not beholden to them. Um, I have long ago learned to to not look at that. The uh, the the. The important thing to remember there is that if you're using a crossover design tool that you basically put your frequency in and your impedance, you're getting the wrong answer, okay? Uh, because those don't understand what the driver is doing. And I have an example of this here. So um, what I've got, if we go to um, uh, the, um, the, oh, the uh, I just see a question here. Uh, the foil style inductors. Yes, I have used those. Um, I have used them where I needed, uh, I specifically used them to do the notch filters for the very high Q residents of the uh, Seos Excel um, magnesium cone woofers uh, because I needed to get, uh, and, and I needed a very low R to get the, the, the very low series R to get the high Q that I needed 
Uh, but the the catch with those is that you basically have to um, like hand tune the capacitor value because it's so high that the woofer notch may be here, but because of tolerances, the the, the crossover notch could be at a different frequency. Uh, so yes, I have used them, uh, but other than that, I just stick with you know sort of the the generic um, uh, perfect lay. Uh, you know, Litz wire, I've used that, but only for RF transmission systems. Um, uh, I used to design cable modems. We'd, we'd have some Litz wire stuff in there. Um, yeah, so, so hold on, coffee. So I've got an example here, and what I'm going to do um, is uh, do a manipulation here. So we're going to make this a short circuit. We're going to make this a short circuit. I'm going to make this an open circuit, okay? So now I am looking at the, uh, I'm, I'm gonna plot the frequency response of uh, this driver and the driver that, that I've measured here, let me make sure I don't drop it, is the SB, uh, SB26 STAC, where's the label on, don't wanna, don't wanna crush a dome. Um, these, this is uh, amongst my favorite in that sort of, 40, 50, 60 dollar price range dome uh, tweeter. Um, I love these guys. I use them all the time. Uh, I think I have 10 of them currently um, waiting for projects. Um, uh, sir, can you please elaborate on the importance of considering the impedance at the crossover point? Uh, yes, I will. I will try and cover that. Um, that itself uh, can be a. Um, uh, yeah, I will try and cover that. Um, it's not a simple answer. It's not a, oh, you just do this. Uh, it is, you have to take in, again, the impedance, you have to take the frequency response of the, the tweeter into account and things like that. So what we're going to do um, is I am going to try and create a first order crossover for this tweeter, okay? And by that, I'm not uh, I'm trying to get this transfer function, the one that you see on the screen. This because that's if if I wanted to make a a time domain accurate speaker with non coincident drivers, um, I, without resorting to to you know DSP processing, um, I need to do this or something similar. There's some pseudo tricks around this. I need to have a, a transfer function like this. Okay, so um, I'm going to plot, and this is the uh, frequency response of the tweeter mounted onto an eight inch wide baffle, okay? And you can see that the tweeter sensitivity is higher than I want the final system sensitivity to be. You can see that the uh, shape of the response is such that um, it's got a, a broad range hump partially because of diffraction, partially because of the natural response of the tweeter, uh, centered around 800 hertz. Uh, it's got a, a, a rising response up towards 20 kilohertz. And um, I am now going to take this tweeter and basically use those textbook um, values that I talked about that you don't want to do, all right? And, and get them to be, and, and put them in to see how close to that um, final response, okay? And so the textbook, if I plug it into the, the textbook formulas, um, to get it down to the, uh, um, to, to do an L pad, to get it down to the, the uh, sensitivity that I want is uh, roughly two ohms and four ohms. I just made them uh, values that um, uh, you can easily buy, okay? And so now if I plot the frequency response of just that L pad and the tweeter um, against that target function, you get this green response, okay? So now I've, I've connected the L pad and I've brought it down, all right? Um, you still see this broad range hump. Uh, you still see this rising response at the high end, okay? Uh, and then there's some deviations, some smaller deviations here, okay? So now, uh, if I go into the, the textbook calculator, um, <laughs> so Brian, you spilled a, a whole glass of cola into the keyboard. Um, 
if it makes you feel any better, the computer that I'm on, Brian, is is my work laptop, which is a uh, uh, very near, which is less than three months old, uh, top of the line uh, MacBook Pro with a lot of extra bells and whistles because we have to do a lot of data analysis for work. Um, and I had it for about three days and I spilled coffee all over it. <laughs> um, so yay, good job, Scott. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so now I'm going to put... Um, the uh the the textbook value and if you go in and you plug those into those calculators it tells you you need a 13.2 microfarad cap okay so now i'm going to make this the value i'm going to plot that curve okay so let's let's talk about what we've really done because to the untrained eye this might seem close enough it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to be a good result. Okay. Will it physically work? Yes. The speaker will make sound. Okay. Um, depending on how loud you play it, the tweeter may not make sound for long. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> IT department says I work for a 12 person company. I, I'm the CTO. There is no IT department. The, I'm also in control of the budget, so I can only scold myself. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, the so so to to the experienced designer, you look at this and you say, "This is not going to give me the results that I want." So, I'm going to clear these steps. Actually, I'm going to give it a few seconds so people can sort of study this. So this was, this was the tweeter by itself. This is the tweeter with just the L pad. And this is the tweeter with the uh, 13 microfarad cap in series. Okay. So now I'm going to clear this and I'm going to plot. So it's a thicker line and we can sort of see the, the deviations. Okay. If, if I put this into a speaker and let's, let's say that I was using the same technique for the woofer and I had even a remotely reasonable woofer response, the summation in this sort of critical mid range region, right? Is going to be really dark Two three K to be down three dB. This is three dB per division on these things. If you're down three dB on w this wide of a Q sort of. Um, uh, dip, that is not going to sound, that's not going to sound particularly well balanced. Okay. The other thing that's going to happen is, is that it's going to start fooling you, especially if you're, you know, younger and still have really good hearing out to these, that it's got a lot of detail. So it's going to be this weird thing and you're going to start playing with uh, potentially the capacitor value, but, but a lot of folks would start playing with sort of the, the, the series resistor and make it a little brighter. Um, and you start ending up with this sort of weird uh, smiley face EQ built into your passive crossover, all right? Um, and and uh, you might get it to sound good on some songs, uh, but it will, uh, you give me a speaker that's got something like this, and I measure the completed speaker, I bet you I can go find source material that makes that speaker sound horrible, all right? Um, uh, I, I've got... Uh, I've got a pretty good track record of going, oh, that's the problem, right? So if I actually wanted to hit this transfer function, what do I need to do? It's clear that the textbook crossovers, which were which are assuming a perfectly wide bandwidth device, flat frequency response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, flat impedance. What do I need to do? Well, I decided, um, <laughs> and you're the IT manager. <laughs> Yeah, Brian, it's really bad when when the when, <laughs> when you're like, oh, yep, that was me. I did it, um, and I'm the one that's supposed to know better. Um, so, so I actually designed a first order, and I'm not a big fan of first order crossovers on dome tweeters. I'm just not. Um, I'll be be honest. I actually designed a crossover, uh, and now I will show it to you. Uh, I have purposely been hiding it until now. Um, so here is the uh, crossover that I came up with. 
Okay, so what we're finding out in the chat is that tech nerds like speakers. Uh, that's pretty much what we're finding out with uh, Rob and Brian. Um, <laughs> shock. This is a shocking revelation that we've come to today. Um, so, so I made a first order filter for this. Now, uh, let me actually minimize this. You can see that the filter that I came up with is quite different quite different than the one that's a textbook, right? If you look at the topology of this thing, uh, we've got a cap and a cap. I don't have an L pad in here, okay? I have a small value of inductance and a series resistor. I've got a notch filter here. I've got a notch filter here, except I'm not using it to filter anything out. I'm actually using it to bypass this part of the crossover to put signal back in, okay? So, so I have got a much more complex uh, crossover. So let's see, oops, ooh, way too big. Let's see the difference in what uh, that crossover does to what the previous one does. All right, now you can see where I've gotten much closer to that transfer function. If I were trying to actually do a speaker with this, and if I were actually trying to make a, a speaker with non-coincident drivers, with drivers that are separate, with, with first order uh, crossover slopes so that I have some hope of having uh, transient accurate reproduction at some single point in space, right? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> keyboard's still working. <laughs> I've got a whole, a whole side conversation happening. Welcome to the internet. Um, uh, if, if I wanted to do that, I would actually probably try and get an even closer, uh, um, result to this transfer function. Even this amount of sort of dip, especially this, this sort of critical two, three kilohertz range where our ears are so sensitive would, would, possibly cause some issues. It may actually sound quite good. Um, uh, BBC can't be wrong. Um, uh, well, it can. Um, but uh, this, this is much closer, okay? If we look at what we put uh, into the filters, what they're actually doing by themselves, let me clear this, okay? This is the transfer function of the crossover that I put in, not this, okay? So to get the right frequency response combination, I need this to be a weird shape. If I look at this one, the other one, the standard sort of textbook crossover, okay? It's actually got much closer to that textbook uh, transfer function. Now it's got a little wiggle here around the driver resonance, but I'm not too worried about it. That's pretty far out of band. Um, but it is not what I need it to be to end up with the resulting acoustical transfer function. Okay. So, um, uh, any questions so far, um, on this, um, is everybody thoroughly, thoroughly, um, uh, afraid of having to do crossovers now? Is that, cause that was really my goal here. Really my goal. And more coffee. More coffee. Um, all right. Well, we're not losing viewers. We're gaining viewers. So I must be doing something right. All right. So now I'm going to go on to a... Um, a uh, and, and for those who are joined, please say hi. Please say hi. Um, now I'm going to go to uh, a higher order crossover. This is typically where I spend 99% of my time uh, is, is higher order crossovers. Open project, uh, please don't crash, please don't crash, please don't crash. Uh, right. Uh, crossover design, filter, not the optimizer. Uh, we'll play with the optimizer maybe later. Frequency, time domain, okay. Whoops, whoops, don't want to show that yet. Nicholas, I'm going to get to the L-pad um, in, in a bit. Um, uh, I've got an example where I do the uh, uh, a different tweeter combo, and I'm going to show you where where that, that L-pad um, can help you and hurt you. Um, 
Uh, uh, well, looks like we're just gonna have to show everything. Okay, so what I did for this one, let me go back to frequency nodes. Uh, and for those wondering, I'm using uh, SoundEasy. It's displayed in the upper corner here. Um, uh, it is it is uh, a very powerful tool. Uh, I might actually call it sound not so easy, uh, but okay. So this is our, uh, <laughs> but it but it for the price, um, uh, it does a lot. Uh, Vidox CAD does a lot of this stuff, but it it's missing at least in the the. Uh, revisions that I've seen, it's missing a uh, important feature in that uh, uh, SoundEasy will emulate, it will do the transfer functions in a, in a sound card, it will emulate your passive crossovers so you can listen to an infinite number of passive crossovers without ever building them. It basically turns your passive crossover into a into a digital filter, a uh, DSP filter, um, and so you can try them out before you, you build them. Um, so this is our, uh, hey Keith, um, uh, <laughs> has changed a bit since yes Daniel it has changed a lot uh, and this is version 26 um, and I'm not uh, there's version 26 has added a bunch of um, features for off-axis optimization that I'm not fully versed with yet uh, and need to need to really dig into one of these days I was kind of hoping to do that this break this uh, holiday break but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get there um, okay so, so now we're going to do a, um, this is, uh, actually I wanted a link with clear plot target. All right. So this is a, uh, uh, I'm going for a link with Riley fourth order. Okay. Um, and I have, um, the same tweeter. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, James, that is a cool feature. <laughs> um, it's it's what sold me on the program years ago uh, when um, uh, LSP CAD uh, Pro stopped updating uh, or they didn't stop updating they they moved to a, a more expensive uh, software set I didn't feel like updating it and I wanted some of the extra features that SoundEasy had uh, and then it took me like three months to get really useful with it uh, and I still have some moments where uh, I use creative language uh, to decide or to to express my um, love and affection for the user interface. Uh, but for, for what it's, what I'm trying to do with it, it's, it's the best thing out there. Um, all right. So I've got the same tweeter, same dome tweeter. So I'm not going to, uh, well, it's a lot harder to plot the transfer function. Uh, you remember what it sort of looked like. Uh, so what I did is I used the same thing. I'm trying to get to a 86, uh, DB 2.83 volt sensitivity speaker. This time I'm trying to design for a, uh, uh, fourth order linkwitz Riley crossover. So this is the acoustical transfer function that I want to get to right here, all right, in red. And this is the textbook crossover. And these are pretty easy to spot with um, uh, looking at them because a lot of times you'll see things like, you know, this, the way the math works out uh, is that this, this first cap and the second cap are either the same value or one's double from the other, uh, things like that, right? And uh, I, I meant to do this earlier, uh, but I didn't. To walk through sort of what's happening here, right? Remember that a capacitor blocks low frequencies. So it's gonna block low frequencies. And the, the few low frequencies that, or the low frequencies that do make it through, the inductor is a short at low frequencies. So, so they made it through these low frequencies and then they get to this part and they go, whoops. And they basically fall down the hole like the old pitfall video game, right? Um, and if they if they don't fall down the hole because the the holes um, basically got a, a grate over it that some of them can walk through because these are not perfect parts right it's not a brick wall filter they get blocked again and then they fall through again right so so what I did was is for this one I, again I used the textbook filters so it's the same L pad and it is you've got four parts here because it's a Linkwitz Riley fourth order crossover and again the textbooks assume that you have this perfect flat impedance. And this uh, this uh, perfect flat frequency response, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, which you don't, right? And and if I plot the answer here, I don't get the right target SPL. I'm not trying to do targets. Frequency. Why are you not uh, clear? Why are you not plotting it? Oh, haha. <laughs> that's why. Point one. Uh, live. The magic of live. 
There we go. Okay. So this is the textbook um, uh, result. Okay. Again, sort of to the to the inexperienced designer, this might look pretty good. To me, I'm looking at this, and it's not quite as bad in terms of the dip in this midband, and and it's following this curve pretty closely. But see how it sort of tails off here and doesn't follow this. One of the one of the hallmarks of a Linkwitz Riley crossover is that the drivers track each other in phase, and that tail, if that's not the right shape they're not necessarily going to track each other in face. <laughs> um, and so you've, you've, you're not going to have a good summation of this uh, uh, speaker, okay? Um, and, and so, so and again, you've got sort of this, this high-frequency rise. The textbook crossover can't take that into account. So what I did is I went through and I used the features of, and this goes back to someone asked about how I, how I handle... Uh, resistance and and this is gonna I'm gonna show you how I do this okay uh, and and it's not the answer I, I don't think it's the answer you want there's no there's no pen and paper way to really to really do this right um, you could but it would just take you forever so this is the crossover that I designed for it okay um, if we compare the two I've got a capacitor here um, before that I put an inductor which is really weird to put an inductor in series on a tweeter, but I'll show you why in a bit. Okay, got a capacitor here. This one is roughly the same as this one, you can see, but it's slightly different value. This inductor matches up to this inductor. Again, slightly different value, 222 microhenries, um, or 0 0.2, uh, 2 millihenries versus 0.23. Uh, Odds are this is such a small difference that you just buy like a 0.2 or 0.22 and, and hope that you know tolerance gets you there. Uh, and then 16 microfarads versus 23. That's way outside tolerance band, right? And then even then, the the L pad values have shifted a little bit. So let's plot that one compared to the transfer function. Now you can see I've matched up this green line matches up much better with the the intended transfer function that I wanted to get to the um, and I've got a completely different uh, schematic for this okay uh, so so I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna show you how I did that and and everybody is going to uh, basically <laughs> gonna scream cheater cheater pumpkin eater is what they're gonna do uh, <laughs> So let me go in here because it tends to get a little confused and put a really high value so that the optimizer doesn't see this. And I'm going to start changing some of these values. So I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, textbook values. And notice that I actually dropped this inductor completely out. Like, like I can get a fourth order transfer, fourth order acoustical function with a third order filter because the driver is already rolling off. I don't need to have four orders there. Um, I'm going to change this to something really wonky. Uh, and I'm going to change this to something kind of wonky. Okay. So now I'm going to replot. I've just changed those values. And this will be fairly educational to show you how much. Okay. So those values mean that I've got this now, which is not what I want. Right. And this is how I deal with the and how... Uh, all the professional designers <laughs> that that uh, have competent tool sets here uh, deal with these non-perfect transfer functions, these non-perfect impedances, and things like that. Sound Easy and Vitoix CAD, however you say that, uh, has what is known as an optimizer. And what that means is I can go in there and let me find my target, make sure my chart, my target's right. So what I've done is I'm telling this this optimizer to ignore this frequency range. I only want to optimize over this frequency range, okay? And then I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna pick the parts that it's going to optimize, okay? So if I say the old values, it's got that weird sh shape that I've got, right? And now I'm gonna hit optimize. Ding, 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 ding. 
it runs through hundreds, in this case, 114 different options that it tried, 114 different values, and it's got algorithms to go in there and sort of force the frequency response to what I want it to be, okay? And I accept those new values, and lo and behold, I have created a, um, and in this case, it actually went back and chose slightly different values than it did before, <laughs> uh, which is always the, uh, which is always the, 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 the thing that you run across, right? It, it could try and do slightly different things. Oh, uh, I bet I had it constrained to six ohms before. Um, so, so it has now optimized and gotten me much closer to that transfer function. I didn't do this with pen and paper. You could, it would just take you forever. You could, I mean, uh, Jeff Bagby did it in spreadsheets, right? Uh, he has some great spreadsheets to, to do these kinds of things. I don't know if it has an optimizer, but you can go in there and you can sort of hand tune all the components. Uh, but if you, if you get good at the, the software, you can make that a lot easier. Uh, it drives pe people absolutely bonkers when I say this, but I can go from uh, measuring a speaker, right? I've got a two-way speaker. I have finished the measurements to flat plus or minus two, three dB in about 10 minutes <laughs> because of that feature, right? Um, that doesn't mean the crossover's done. The crossover is nowhere near done at that point because now I have to check uh, tweeter distortion. I have to check off axis dispersion, all these sorts of things, but I can get that flat really fast, okay? Um, and it drives people bonkers when they, that, you know, that they, they work for so long to, to get a, a reasonably flat on axis response. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's like 10 minutes. Uh, Three-way speaker, it might be half an hour, right? They can, um, they can be a little bit trickier, especially with, uh, uh, if you're watching impedances and you're trying not to, to crush the amplifier with, with getting a low impedance in there. Um, these optimizers can also limit your impedance. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to prioritize impedance and say I want it to be a six ohm speaker instead of a four ohm. So now I've got a four ohm tweeter, right? Um, uh, but I'm gonna try and make this a six ohm speaker. I'm gonna hit optimize again. Okay. Uh, and it re-optimized, and how different are these values? Yeah, so this is, this is it's closer. It, it brought up, it couldn't get to six ohms, but it brought the impedance up uh, minimum uh, up uh, from like 3.7 to 4.4 ohms. Uh, and it came back to the, the previous values. Now, whoops, I didn't mean to optimize again. We're just gonna get the same thing. Okay, accept new values. Now, I'm gonna show you what this uh, inductor is doing. Remember what I said about inductors, they block high frequencies. So we're gonna make this a short circuit. Uh, crossover sign, frequency time domain. Okay, remember this rise? That's what that inductor is taking care of, okay? Uh, it, is, it is damping that out. If, if I take uh, that inductor out and make it a short circuit, you see that value versus that. So this is, that inductor is, is a short circuit, it's not there versus that inductor is present, okay? Um, and, you know, frankly, as I get older and I have dealt with screaming kids in a car, I'm losing my high frequency hearing, right? So I have started to put my speakers to have a little bit more lift up in this range uh, uh, versus uh, what I used to do, which that would used to drive me absolutely bonkers, but you get a four-year-old just, just screaming bloody murder in a closed space. Um, and yeah, you're gonna lose some of your high frequency hearing. Um, uh, so it's not age-related, it's child-related, I swear. Uh, so, uh, Benjamin, yes. So, so what you have to do afterwards, um, that, that cap, uh, uh, yeah. And, and Brian, it does, does offer it. I just showed that Benjamin, what you have to do afterwards is you have to go back, uh, <laughs> and, and put in values that you're going to be able to buy. So like, you're going to be able to buy a 16 microfarad cap. Okay. Uh, and now I'll plot it again and you'll see the difference. It's right on top of it. In fact, uh, this is probably a, an educational thing to do. So there's 16 microfarads, 15 microfarads, 14 microfarads, 
See how little it's changing? Now it's changing mostly down here, okay? But see how little it's changing? So that's why when people are, you know, uh, are measuring these devices, in fact, there was somebody on uh, DIY Project Pad recently that that was uh, said something that had a that we're trying to compare uh, two capacitors, one electrolytic, uh, one film, uh, and they were showing massive differences between the two. And we were like, either you measured something wrong or the cap's broken, because that's not going to happen, right? Um, even a five percent change on some of these values, depending on where it is in the circuit, is not going to make that big of a difference. Some parts do make a big difference and it behooves you. It's an advantage to go through and change these values and to see which ones uh, make a huge difference. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not released yet, but I did uh, a uh, open baffle design for one of the vendors um, where there's one particular part that is that is fairly critical and and changing it uh, more than 5% is a really bad idea. Um, and I actually had to note that in the write-up. Uh, once we get that released, you'll, you'll see it and I'll talk about it. Um, so, um, so, okay. So this is, is sort of how I do it, right? I use the tool set to my advantage. Now, sound easy, costs money. Uh, I paid for it um, and have been dutifully, I, my first sound easy was version 4.0. And every few versions, I send uh, Bodan um, the 25 bucks an update. Uh, and now I'm at version 26. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, you know, and I'll keep updating it. Uh, I'm, in fact, I'm tempted to buy a second copy at this point so I can have it on two different machines and don't have to walk between them. Um, so, yeah, so uh, this is this is how... Uh, a, a advanced sort of passive crossover design is done. Now I'm going to talk about the L pads and I'm going to move to a completely different design because this is um, instead of a dome tweeter, I'm going to get my, my handy dandy samples. I measured and I'm going to show you how to, what happens when you start using compression drivers because compression drivers and horns uh, get a really bad rap for um, harsh sound when they shouldn't. And I'm going to show you why or what I think is happening to a lot of folks. Okay, so the, the compression driver and horn that I measured was the BNC DE250, which is this sort of beast of a thing. Uh, on the Fital Pro uh, STH100, uh, this is, a, I want to say this is a 60 by 70 Tractrix, uh, and it's one of my all-time favorite um, uh horn lenses. I, I love the sound of this thing. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, compression drivers. This has been around for a long time. A lot of people like this. Uh, and uh, it probably drives <laughs> Jason <laughs> and Bennett bonkers that I'm putting the two of them together. Uh, but, you know, I guess I'll just have to deal. Um, uh, all right. So, uh, let me pull up that file. Open project. Okay. Load. All right. And again, crossover design, frequency, time domain. All right. Okay. Now, I am going to, let me clear... Don't want that one on. Oh, this is the one that was acting weird, so I do want that one on. Uh, clear. Okay, so now um, I am going to uh, design a crossover. I'm going to show you a crossover design for this uh, tweeter. Uh, and oh, all right, bear with me while I do this. Um, open short open short open this is excruciating television i'm sure open okay <laughs> okay Woo! all right it's off the top of the chart uh <laughs> all right so this is the frequency response of the bnc driver measured on that horn that I showed you. 
Uh, Ossian, yes. Yes, you can. Um, you can use slightly different values. Uh, you can also combine values. Um, you can you can wire uh, capacitors in parallel uh, and combine them. You can wire inductors in series, although for speakers, I wouldn't do that because the, the equivalent series resistance tends to shoot up on you real fast. Um, uh, it was worthwhile uh, to propose the open short function. I, I use it uh, more often than I thought I would. Uh, it has become, become handier. Okay, so um, this, this driver, uh, again, I created a textbook uh, crossover for it. Uh, I put in the 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 values or the you know the like I, I created an L pad, and lo and behold, um, you, if you'll notice that uh, the the topology of the crossover. This is the textbook one. This is what I ended up with. Um, I'll show you that in a bit. Uh, the topology of it is the same, right? Because the textbook doesn't know that this tweeter has a completely different frequency response. Remember the other one had a slightly rising response uh, starting at about 2K, uh, then a peak up at uh, like 15 kilohertz, and then a peak up at like 6, 800 hertz, right? Uh, this tweeter driver has a, um, uh, a much different response. But the, the textbook crossover doesn't know that. It doesn't know that it's trying to, to to make something different. So now that I've put this uh, back into place, I'm going to, and hopefully this doesn't break on me, plot. Okay. So I have put a um, uh, an L pad in there, and and basically what I did is I read off of the spec sheet for the driver that it had a certain sensitivity, and I put in an L pad to attenuate it down to the uh, the level that I want my my final speaker to be. And I will do this all the time for, for home speakers. I will use this 108 decibel sensitivity compression driver on this horn and make an 86 decibel sensitivity uh, speaker at the end. I, I literally don't care, right? Uh, everybody talks about, well, you're, you, you can't do it because they, they, they don't match, they're too far apart. Balderdash, rubbish. Um, it, you absolutely can. And it sounds phenomenal because whereas even the finest dome tweeters, if you run them hard enough, ragged enough, cross them over low, they'll start to distort or, or have some, some compression. Usually you're, it's really loud or you're in a really big room, uh, in a, in a home setting, uh, for a compression driver, you will literally never have that. Uh, and if you are compressing a, a compression driver in a home setting, your deaf is a post. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, and so, um, uh, so when I look at this comparison again, sort of to the to the to the beginner speaker builder, this may not seem that bad, but notice that I've got this big hump at two three kilohertz, okay, over the desired uh, over the desired target function. Your ear's really sensitive to extra energy in this region, right? It is not going to like this. This is going to sound harsh. And I believe this is actually one of the reasons why a um, uh, horn drivers get a bad rap uh, for, for home systems is because if you leave this kind of stuff in here, it is going to sound really, really forward and harsh and, and, and bad, frankly, just bad. Um, and the thing with the uh, that you have with compression drivers, and, and the reason why L pads by themselves aren't enough, is because they tend to have this on this um, on a horn. They tend to have this uh, shape, this humped shape, uh, more often than not. Right? Some horns don't have it as bad. Some horns have it worse than this one. Right? Like exponential horns. Um, and, and constant directivity horns tend to have this pretty bad. This Tractrix uh, with this particular driver, uh, beast of a driver is, is not as bad as others. I have seen this, this looks to me, it's roughly six dB. I have seen this be eight, 10 dB. And if you use an L pad, which level are you bringing down? L pads are actually gonna be fairly broadband and even, right? So where do you match it? it if, if it's gonna have this much variation up and down, where are you going to set your middle point of that L pad? An L pad by itself isn't enough. You need to have the L pad and 
equalization, okay? And you can do that in the passive crossover. You absolutely can. Again, you have to sort of always take away, right? So what you do is you set your L pad so that um, uh, it 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 is the the lowest level of the speaker starts to hit the transfer function. Then you start hacking away at the rest of it, right? Um, in this case, uh, the values and things like that are completely different, okay? To get a better approximation, you can see that I went with a much simpler device. And in fact, it's so simple, I'm afraid that it's not actually gonna be as close as I had hoped. Uh, this may be one that I saved, <laughs> now that I'm looking at it. Uh, this may be one that I saved uh, before actually having completed the optimization. So we may get to see me try and do this live. Um, uh, so maybe not, maybe not. Oh no, 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 I did. <laughs> I did good. Okay. so. Um, so this is the crossover with optimization that I came up with for that driver. <laughs> Look how much simpler this thing is, right? So um, I actually used a much different um, uh, or a fairly different uh, L pad and I optimized and really changed the uh, uh, values of these in, uh, crossover parts. So instead of a fourth order electrical crossover, I'm using a second order. Instead of a fairly large cap, I'm using a fairly tiny cap. And I end up with a much closer, uh, much closer match to that curve. If I were doing this again, uh, for demonstration purposes, I did this uh, fairly quickly. If I were doing this for um, uh, sort of a, a production speaker, I might look at trying to bring this a little bit closer, especially in this knee region. I might look at trying to notch some of this out. Down here, this may not be that big of a deal. Uh, I might leave this alone. Uh, and I may actually start to, to take a look at what this sounds like. I may start playing with, with uh, doing something uh, for these humps up here. Again, because this may add, at first glance, it may add a little sparkle, but for long-term listening, it might end up being a little fatiguing, right? Um, I can also uh, do things where um, I take with the optimizer, I can sort of start tilting this response downward uh, to remove some of that fatigue as well. All right, so um, uh, <laughs> being 55 years old has its benefits. What happens above 10 kilohertz doesn't con concern me. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on my way, Brian. I am on my way. Um, uh, let's see, what other questions do we have? Uh, and actually let me, before I answer those, all right. Looks like I covered everything that I wanted to. Uh, we're at an hour. I will entertain some questions here. Let's see. Um, can you configure sound easy to use only available values? Uh, if you can, uh, I don't know how to do it. Um, I haven't seen that. Uh, maybe we can, maybe we can ask for that feature. Uh, the, the, uh, LSP CAD used to do that. Uh, I don't find it to be that big of a deal because frankly, uh, frankly, a lot of the inductors tend to be non-standard. They're not E12, E24 uh, standardized values. Uh, so I, I, you know, and I've done this long enough where I kind of remember the standard values or standard-ish values so I can get myself close enough. Uh, lots of people use, uh, do you measure... Uh, do you measure the frequency response within sound easy? Um, I, for this demo, I actually measured in REW, uh, both uh, frequency response and impedance, uh, and imported it. Uh, I measure in sound easy. Uh, it just depends on, uh, what I'm trying to do. Um, it depends on sound, um, uh, REW, not a while ago, added the, the timing function, the, the loopback channel with the timing function before that it wasn't as particular, it wasn't as useful. It was hard to, to find the, the acoustic center and put those drivers in um, because that, that's actually input um, in the, in the um, uh, that's actually input into uh, sound easy. It takes that into account. Um, I don't think, uh, I think I don't care about that 15 kilohertz on onward up dip. Nah, 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 nah. I don't, um, uh, you know, my kids might. They're 12, 15. They're, they probably still hear up there. Um, although with my 15-year-old, as, as often as I get after her for listening to headphones so loudly, she might not already. Um, uh, 
Have I ever used the uh, CEOs waveguides? Yes, I have. Um, I was not a fan. Um, uh, other people have had different experiences. I'll leave it at that. Um, how do you bring in the driver response from REW? Do you use the far and near response? Um, there's some import functions. Um, driver in, uh, driver transfer function creation in SoundEasy is, is a whole nother series of videos. That's one of the... Uh, that's one of the things that drive newbies nuts about that, uh, in this program, uh, because yeah, it's, it's really weird. Um, what a transformer does in a crossover. Okay. So, um, there's three things that you could be asking about there. Odds are you're talking about an inductor. That's this thing that may look like a transformer. Uh, they actually wind inductors on transformer cores uh, for really high values. Like if you need like a 20 or 30 millihenry or even higher value inductor, they will wind that on there. Um, it can also be an auto former, uh, not to get too far into the weeds, uh, where you're using that to match levels instead of a resistive voltage divider. Uh, it could also be an actual transformer uh, in the case of like a ribbon tweeter or something like that that has a, a true ribbon tweeter that has a very low impedance. Um, so there's many things that that could be. Um, Nicholas, any issues? Um, um, that's a really good question, Nicholas. Um, for home speakers... I typically don't worry too, too much about that. I put a 10 or a 15 watt resistor in there and I just don't worry about it too much. Um, I can actually, let me, let me sound easy. <laughs> this is turning into a commercial for sound, sound not so easy. Uh, let me go back to a different project here. Uh, and this may take me a second to do. Mm, frequency time domain. Uh, frequency, uh, which nodes, which one is, okay, all right, oh, here's the, this will be interesting, uh, I think, yeah, uh, so uh, this is the dome tweeter uh, optimized to that transfer function versus the, the uh, uh, compression driver tweeter. SoundEasy has the ability to look at your dissipated power, okay? So it looks at this resistive component, right? So this is the equivalent series resistance of the inductor. Uh, and you'll see these, these node numbers here, this 15 uh, or 11 here. Uh, so node 12 is um, uh, crossover design. Um, where's my, oh, dissipated power. Uh, where is the node window that tells me branches? Ah, uh, 12, I think this is the feature. Okay. So, uh, what I've done is I have plotted the power dissipation in the series element for a 2.3 um, volt input. Uh, and you can see that this is at each of these frequencies, right? Um, so, you know, that's for an output SPL of 86 decibels. Um, if I change this to a six volt drive level, um, you might dissipate four watts, okay? Um, but you gotta understand that, you know, music has a crest factor associated with it. And, you know, if you're, if you're listening to uh, a speaker at this kind of level, it's actually 12 dB less power dissipation continuous uh, if the peaks are up here, right? 
Uh, so that's why I really don't worry about it too, too much. Uh, for PA speakers, I have been known to put 25 or 50 watt resistors in that location. Um, if, if it is a passive PA speakers, that is, that is one of the advantages of active crossovers that you don't have to do that. Uh, but in some cases you, you don't want to go with that. You, you, the end user doesn't have, uh, the desire to have a plate amp in that speaker, uh, that if it dies, the speaker's dead. They just want to roll up with any old amp and run a cable over to that speaker and turn it on and go. Right. Um, uh, yep. Um, yeah, uh, Ben, you're right. Uh, if you, if you need to get to an inductor value by the size up and then unwind and use your impedance function, uh, measurement function in REW or whatever, uh, to figure out your value. Um, uh, I have done that on a couple of occasions, uh, and, and where I desperately need a particular value and it is sensitive, usually in, in a notch filter. Um, uh, but as far as I know, uh, transformers affect also the frequency response and not only the voltage. Uh, if you're using that transformer in a tweeter, um, it shouldn't be affecting the, the, you can make transformers very wide bandwidth. Um, I've, I've specified some custom transformers with hundred kilohertz bandwidth, so you can make them very wide bandwidth. They should, they should impact the tr frequency response, uh, assuming a, a flat impedance, very little. Um, Let's see, uh, question, any other questions? Let's see. That's an expensive transformer, by the way. Those things were like $300 a pop, plus about two or three grand. This was for a military application, plus about two or three grand of non-recurring engineering. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? We're at an hour and 10 minutes. Let's see. No other questions? Type now. Type fast. Type fast. <laughs> that, that dissipation is for a sine wave at that frequency. Um, uh, so, so it basically swept that sine wave through and it's showing, um, the, it's showing the, uh, uh, frequency response at that frequency or the, the power dissipation at that frequency. Why do ribbons have such narrow dispersion? Um, <laughs> are there any critical values in my SBX3? Uh, the SBX3, I don't think has anything particularly critical. Uh, I think, I think plus or minus 5% on everything in there is, is okay. Um, I don't have those files on this computer. Otherwise we could like pull it up and painstakingly march through those components and make everybody watch us. Um, when do I decide to switch? Uh, let me get back to that ribbons thing in a bit. Um, when do I decide to switch from air core to iron core? Uh, that is primarily dependent on what my wallet is feeling like. <laughs> uh, no, so that's, that's sort of the smart ass answer, but, uh, yeah, it, it's mostly true. Uh, once I get above about one and a half, two millihenries, uh, that's when I start looking at, uh, iron cores, uh, you, to get larger inductance values than that and have a low ESR, a uh, low equivalent series resistance for an air core starts to mean really massive uh, gauge wire, really massive and expensive inductors. And so uh, I, I, once, once you hit that, that's when the, the, the price performance curve for me uh, hits it. And for, for like, this is a, this, iron core inductor that I have here. This is one that I'd use uh, typically on a PA speaker. Uh, there are smaller ones um, that are laminated core. I don't know if, I don't know if this camera is good enough to pick up on this. I'm sure that was good video. Um, uh, that are like 18 gauge wire on a, on a much smaller laminate core that's rated to like 150, 250 Watts uh, for home speakers. And 
Uh, if you took your average, you know, seven, eight inch, six, seven, eight inch woofer, uh, and you ran that thing so that the iron core inductor was saturating, um, it, I doubt the woofer would last long. Uh, the iron that that inductor's beefy enough to handle what you would do in the home. The driver will die first. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, when you need higher inductance, yeah, that's that's pretty much, um, that's pretty much the you know I mean, the, in tweeter circuits. Um, you'll occasionally see this parallel inductor. Uh, you sort of want to damp that out and you'll see, and, and I've got a couple of designs out there where I've started to add resistance here. Um, in that case, you can go with like the cheapest inductor you can find and then add resistance. Cause really what you're paying for with the expensive ones is copper. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's, that's the, um, uh, that's the thing. Um, let me go back to that ribbon. Um, ribbons have uh, typically have dispersion or the, the dispersion set by the physical properties of the ribbon. So if it's a really tall ribbon, it's going to have very narrow vertical dispersion. Um, and if it's a really wide sort of, you know, planar source speaker, it'll have really narrow dispersion. It's set by its physical properties. So that's why, um, you know, uh, it, it, basically off axis is canceling from, from, sound made other places um uh, it's the same reason that you know woofers start to beam right um they they narrow their dispersion pattern at higher and higher frequencies um do i like the sound of my two by two by 18 bass reflex or neiman horn boy we're we're going over everything uh today this is, <laughs> it's a good thing i'm just just add enough to to follow all these um it depends uh if i need I mean, the challenge with the, the, the big front loaded horns is that, um, because of the horn path length and their, their natural sort of roll offs, uh, it can be a little bit more challenging to integrate them into a system. Uh, the base reflex, uh, subs are more forgiving of goofs, um, in terms of, uh, delays and things like that. They, t they tend to be a bit more forgiving. Uh, the horn can really make you pay if you get that wrong. Um, you get some really muddy bass sounds if you do it wrong. Uh, if you do it right, if you have both of them right, they actually sound very similar. Um, the advantage of the, the big horn loaded sub is that it has just face melting, awesome <laughs> man giggle inducing output. Uh, <laughs> it's not like the, the double 18 bass reflex boxes are slouches by any means, but you buy another six db of bass uh for for horn loading number six or eight depending on the the bandwidth uh, maybe be more than that i have to go back and plot the the two plots over each other that buys you a lot of output i mean uh these things sitting behind me will do you know in this room um i have i have clicked or uh, clipped the the isemcon uh microphone which is 143 db uh and and it was you know drywalls coming out of the ceiling and stuff like that I mean, that was just mind-boggling output so just for fun factor i prefer the 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 horns um but for your application if you're trying to if you're trying to uh set up and you you've got two people two people can't lift one of these right but two people can lift the base reflex box so you just bring a bunch of base reflex boxes um uh how important is polar response <laughs> Oh, James, that's almost everything. Uh, frequency response, polar response. It's, it's, it's really important. I mean, that is, that is where you make or break. That's why I, when I was talking about, uh, it, it drives people bonkers that I can get to a flat response on axis in like 10 minutes. Um, they're like, Oh my God, I'd be done with a crossover in 10 minutes. No, that's just when I'm starting. Uh, it's hours and hours and hours to make sure that the polar response is where I want it. Uh, which is why I need to dig into these features of sound easy, uh, version 26. Uh, because my, my old method requires me to, uh, basically have multiple computers and I'm using sound easy to emulate and I'm starting to, to spin the speaker and measure the polar response off uh, vertical and horizontal axis and things like that. So I'm using the, using sound easy to, to emulate the filter and I'm using another computer to measure it. Right. Um, uh, Ben, don't get hangry. Don't get hangry. I'm about to get, go get lunch myself, but, uh, don't get hangry. Go get lunch. Um, do you ever fix phase issues uh, with passive crossovers? 
uh, yes. Um, uh, uh, I have to fix those all the time. Uh, I will I will implement, in fact, uh, some of the tricks that I'll use is that tail that I talked about, uh, on the, especially on, like, on the link with Riley, where I will purposely put uh, a, a um, let me bring back up this plot because I will show this. So see see how it's nicely tracking this? Uh, if I need to, to play with adjust phase, I will actually add another component and, and slightly out of the frequency band start bending that tail either up or down. Um, and that will change the phase just enough through the crossover reason sometime to get a better summation, right? Um, that is, that is something, you know, if you, and if you, if you just looked at the frequency response thing, uh, of, of the thing, you, you wouldn't see that big of a difference, but the, the phase tracking between the devices, uh, I will occasionally, uh, I don't like to do it passive because they're expensive. I will I will occasionally use a ladder delay network or uh, or some sort of uh, all pass to to try and get there, but mm, that that starts to add up in price. When you start doing that, that's that's one of my for one of my sort of checkpoints for. Am I designing on the right axis? Am, would it be easier to do a mechanical change like a tilted baffle, or do I just need to go active? Um, that's, that's sort of where, where I look at, I'm not going to demonstrate the tone burst again. It's not, it's the amps are on. I'm sorry. Last time I was given a demonstration, I didn't warn people and I had a very wide bandwidth, non low pass uh, microphone on it, which was a complete accident. And I think there were some folks watching, uh, that, that might've lost some eardrums, uh, with in-ear monitors or, uh, might've had some, uh, uh, subwoofers go, uh, cause, uh, do I use PTC devices? Um, yes. No and maybe. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, how much I think that uh, the folks are going to torture them. Uh, it, they are very, very tricky to get uh, right in terms of activating to protect the tweeter, but not activating in normal use. Um, and these days, uh, honestly, with like, uh, if you burn out, uh, a high frequency driver, um, of any real quality, you've done some pretty spectacular work and that speaker sounded God awful for a long time. Uh, and, and it happens like I've, I've, we've all been at places and you know, the DJ is sitting there and the, the red lines are blinking on everything. And you're, you're in fact, um, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, I was walking uh, past and the, the guy had, um, where was I? I was, I was on a trip. It was a business trip. I'm trying to remember where I was. It might've been DC and there's sort of an outdoor, uh, patio area. And they had the Yamaha speakers that had the little lamp that would tell you that you're, and I mean, that thing was just like glowing <laughs> and, and <laughs> I leaned over to the guy. I was like, that's not a, that's not a excite the crowd light feature dude, that's, that's your tweeters about to die. Uh, and he looked at me like, what? Um, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I own 12 inch woofer or two. Um, I hope not. I hope I didn't actually blow up woofers. Uh, what is the best way to view adjusting those tails phase response? Yes. Uh, phase response, but that's, that's a sound easy specific thing. Uh, phase response is the best way to adjust those tails. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, uh, versus, Ooh, I missed something. Gene M. Does it make sense to optimize your crossover for your listening room? That's a tough one. Um, I will adjust the, like for my own personal speakers, I will adjust the tonal balance for my listening room. Uh, but I do such like, I am such a convert for constant directivity. Like that my, my synergy horns upstairs, uh, will only be replaced by other synergy horns where the listening room, uh, overall decay time and brightness is really what I'm adjusting. I'm not adjusting for early reflections, uh, because they're not happening. I, they're, they're just not happening. Um, Uh, Ben, that's about right. Um, 20 dB. 
Um, and nobody else, unless they're a sound easy user, nobody's getting that, this conversation. We're having like a whole side conversation on our, on our own here. Um, so yeah. Uh, any more, any more questions? I'm going to shut it down in about five minutes. Um, Scott, is there any value with optimizing your crossover speaker to your, uh, uh, honestly, I, I, you know, I don't use, I currently don't use room correction, um, again, because, you know, I've got these, uh, constant directivity, time domain ac accurate, coincident source speakers. Um, and so I just don't need to, I've used it. It's, uh, for, you know, direct radiator type stuff, uh, you know, standard speakers and it's, it, it, it does a good job. Um, I, I, I have never been a fan of using it a lot. Um, like I don't go for heavy correction. I try and use a very light touch uh, because when you start doing really heavy corrections, uh, I I swear there's a bunch of artifacts around that that make it sound really wonky to me. Um, it takes away a lot. Uh, and frankly, if you're doing really heavy corrections, you might need to work on your room or placement within that room uh, and and, and that's the bigger problem. Um, Keith, that, um, so I plan on doing a woofer and, and I, I don't know when I'm going to do that. I'm sorry this one took so long to actually do. I, I started teasing doing another one a while, like three weeks ago. And then my water heater um, decided to, to start leaking and it's in the attic uh, because that's the way they build houses in this area. And it started basically... <laughs> Um, the water heater started peeing on our heads, um, <laughs> which is not a good thing. And I have hardwood floors and they're buckling in one spot now. So now I have a different problem. Um, uh, I think the reverse nulls is probably going to be like two videos from now. Um, the answer is it depends. The short answer is it depends. If you're going for a Linkwitz Riley type crossover, uh, you want, uh, with, with, uh, uh, direct radiator type drivers. So dome tweeter, um, uh, dome, dome woofer or a, a cone woofer. You want a deep reverse, reverse null, um, most of the time. If you're doing a PA speaker, uh, cause I know you work on some of those as well. If you're asking for those, uh, it is not something that I typically go for. Uh, I'm looking, I'm basically designing the frequency response at 25, 30, 40 degrees off axis, uh, especially as l if they're going to be a raid or anything like that. So it's completely different. Uh, I would use, uh, for the SBX3, I'd use 10 watts. Uh, if I remember correctly, there might be a resistor in the woofer of that one that might be a 25, but I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm having vague memories of that, but I've designed and released enough designs where I don't remember. I'd have to go look. It should say on the write-up, like, and if it doesn't, if it... Like, like if I'm not, if I'm not putting a, a wattage value on a, a schematic, it's your standard 10 watt wire round sand cast jobbies are just fine. Um, uh, I will, I will make note of the, the higher power resistors. So, <laughs> ew, heater P. Yeah, it's, it's not pleasant. It was so rusty. It was so nasty, dude. Uh, I still need to get back up there and, and put the insulation back that, uh, the, uh, I've, I've, I've been, I've got a blower fan on it and have for a week and a half to dry out the attic. And I pulled out all that insulation. Oh, I was, it was a mess. That was bad. Um, got it. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, you have a good day. Um, uh, you know, if there's other questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me on uh, Project Pad uh, or Speaker Freakers or even my own DIY RM page. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to go build some speakers and today, uh, I've the rest of the day off. And I'm going to go work on those speakers that I uh, made the uh, uh, whoopsie on yesterday um, where I glued the pieces to the wrong spot four times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good day, everybody. Talk to you later.